Okay, in section 5.3 we're going to talk about Riemann sums and definite integrals. Uh, in the definition of area given in the previous section, uh, that should be 5.2, uh, the partitions were divided into subintervals of equal width. Uh, this was just done for computational convenience. In the next example, uh, you're going to see that it's not necessary to have subintervals that are of equal width. So, consider the region bounded by the graph of the square root of x. Here's our square root of x function. And, and the x-axis for x values between 0 and 1. So we're starting at the origin, and we're going as far as x equals 1, uh, as shown in the figure. We're going to evaluate the limit, uh, the, the summation from i equals 1 to n, and we're going to let that n go to infinity, of the function times delta x sub i, where c sub i is the right endpoint of the partition given by i squared over n squared, and delta x is the width of the ith interval. So here, our intervals are not going to be of equal width. You know, we just didn't do b minus a divided by n and get, you know, 1 minus 0 divided by n or 1 over n. That's not going to be our width. Our width is given as i squared over n squared. So if we look down here at the picture, you know, our first right endpoint will be 1 squared over n squared or just 1 over n squared. And that height will be 1 over n. And then our next endpoint is going to be 2 squared over n squared. And then 3 squared over n squared, 4 squared over n squared, dot, 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 all the way up to n minus 1 quantity squared over n squared. And finally, our last right endpoint would be 1 itself. So these intervals are of non-equal width. But that doesn't matter when we're doing one of these summations. When we saw in the previous sections, our uh, lower and upper sums both come to the same limit. And that's also going to hold true for these intervals of different widths. So let's start checking this problem out here. We have uh, c sub i. That was given to us. That's i squared over n squared. And our delta x. Delta x. The difference between two endpoints is going to be the upper one, i squared over n squared, minus the next lowest one, which would be i minus 1 quantity squared over n squared. And that's right here. You know, here's our last endpoint, i squared over n squared. The one previous to it is n minus 1 squared over n squared. So this is going to be our delta x, the width of any given partition. And if we, fo you know, we have a common denominator, we could FOIL this out and then collect our like terms. And we're going to wind up with 2i minus 1 over n squared when it's all said and done. So we're going to look at this again. It's a limit as n goes to infinity of the summation from i equals 1 to n of f of c sub i times delta x, or in this case, you know, our function was the square root of x function. So it's going to be the square root of i squared over n squared. This is the, oh, well, let me just continue here. And then it's, we're going to multiply that by uh, the width, 2i minus 1 over n squared. And you know, what we have here, this part is the height of each rectangle. You know, we plug that value into the function, and we see how high up the y-axis we go. This next part here is the width, our delta x of each rectangle. So height times width will be the area of the rectangles. And let's see here, when we take, oh, we'll just do it step by step. This is still our limit as n goes to infinity from i is 1 to n. The square root of i squared over n squared is just i over n. And then we have our width, 2i minus 1 over n squared. Let's pull some stuff out in front of the summation symbol. So our limit as n goes to infinity. We have these denominators. n squared times n is n to the third. And that is a denominator. So we'll stick it under 1. And then we'll have our summation from i equals 1 to n, what are we going to have left is just our numerators. i times this numerator. And right now, I'm going to distribute that. Uh, i times 2i is 2i squared minus i. And let me clear
clear out a little workroom here. So we pulled a bunch of stuff out in front of that summation symbol. Let's do our formula substitution for those i's. So we still have our limit. We're going to send end off to infinity, 1 over n to the third. And now we will get rid of the summation symbol by plugging in the formulas. So we have 2 times i squared, or 2. And then the substitution for i squared is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1, all over uh, 6. And then minus, we have i. And the replacement for i is n times n plus 1 over 2. And to make our simplification here a little, even a little easier, you know, we have two terms in the brackets here. And we have an n in the th to the third out here in the denominator. So we can cancel. I'll sort of factor an n out of these numerators. I'll factor out this n and this n. And that will cancel with one of these in the denominator. So that gets now knocked down to an n squared in that denominator. And just on the numbers here, we have a 2 over 6. We can factor that 2 down and factor that 6 down to a 3. So that's going to make this uh, a little easier to work with. And I'm going to try to do as much as I can of this in one step. So we have our limit as n goes to infinity. Let's see now here in this first piece, I'll underline it here in blue. What we have our numerator are these two binomials. And if I FOIL them out, I'm going to get 2n squared. And then I'm going to get a plus 1n and a plus 2n, which is plus 3n. And then the last terms 1 times 1 is 1. And when I distribute this outside denominator here, n squared to the 3 that I already have, I'm going to have a 3n squared. And I'll make each of these their own separate fraction. So these are all 3n squareds. And then we have minus. Uh, here we have just an n plus 1. And when we distribute this negative, that's going to be a minus n and then a minus 1 for our numerators. And the denominator here is already a 2. Multiplying by the n squared we already have out front will be 2n squared and another 2n squared. So now we're ready to apply that uh, the limit. We're going to let n go to infinity. So let's see, here our n's cancel. So we're just left with the coefficients in front, 2 thirds. Here the 3's are going to reduce to 1. And the numerator n will be wiped out by one of the denominators. So we have 1 over infinity which is 0. And then we have 1 over 3 times infinity squared, which as n goes to infinity, that heads to 0. Uh, here our one numerator n is taken out one of these in the denominator. 1 over 2 times infinity is 0. Minus 1 over 2 times infinity squared is 0. So we have our answer, 2 thirds. The area underneath the curve of the square root function between 0 and 1 is 2 thirds. And again, this time we just used uh, intervals of unequal width. We could have done this problem with left-hand sums or right-hand sums, and we would have got exactly the same answer. So, from example 7, 2, or example 7 in the previous section, for us it was 5, 2. You know that the region shown in figure 418 down here has an area of 1 third. Because the square bounded by 0 and 1, and y is between 0 and 1, if we just look at this as a square, we know it has area 1. And you can conclude that the area of the region shown in figure 417 has an area of 2 thirds. You know, we did this was just a square, area 1. In the previous section, we found that area was 1 third when we were oriented to the y axis. Now we just found the area under here, and it turned out to be 2 thirds. And that makes sense. A third plus 2 thirds is 1. And this agrees with the limit found in example 1, even though the example uses the partition having these unequal subinterval widths. The reason this particular partition gave a proper area as n increases is the width of the largest subinterval approaches, approaches 0. Uh, this is a key feature in the development of definite integrals. So in that previous section, the limit of a sum was used to define the area of a region in a plane. Finding areas by this means is only one of many applications involving uh, the limit of a sum. 
A similar approach can be used to determine quantities as diverse as arc lengths, average values, centroids, volumes, works, surface area. The following definition is named after Georges Friedrich Bernard Riemann. Although the definite integral had been defined and used long before Riemann came along, he generalized the concept and it covered a broader category of functions. In the following definition of a Riemann sum, notice that the function f has no restrictions other than being defined on some interval from a to b. In the preceding section, uh, the function f was always seen to be or assumed to be continuous and non-negative because we were dealing with the area under a curve. And here is our definition of a Riemann sum. Let f be defined on a closed interval from a to b, and let delta be a partition of this uh, interval from a to b. Given by, here's our left and right endpoints, a and b. And a is equal to our first piece, x sub 0. And then that is less than x sub 1 x sub 2 is less than dot dot dot. Come all the way over here to the right end point of b, we can call that x sub n, our last interval. And then the one before that would be x uh, sub n minus 1, x sub n minus 2, and so on. And it, where delta x sub i is the width of the ith sub interval. If c sub i is any point in the ith sub interval, then the sum, this Riemann sum, the summation from i equals 1 to n of f of c sub i, times delta x sub i on that uh, closed interval is called a Riemann sum of the function f for the partition delta. So the width of the largest subinterval of a partition delta is called the norm of the partition and it's denoted by, these look like absolute value bars, but they're doubles, uh, the norm of delta. If every subinterval is of equal width, then the partition is a regular partition. And the norm is denoted by, you know, this norm is equal to delta x, which is just b minus a divided by n, a regular partition. For a general partition, the norm is related to the number of subintervals in our closed interval from a to b in the following way. We take our endpoints and subtract them, b minus a, just like we did up here, and we divide that by this norm. And that's always less than or equal to n. So the number of subintervals in a partition approaches infinity as the norm of the partition approaches zero. That is, the norm, the norm approaches zero implies that n approaches infinity. And the converse of this statement is not true. And you can, you know, just read on to that later. It's not too critical to what we're doing here. So, and this part here is good. In a regular partition, however, the statements, the norm approaches zero and n approaches infinity are equivalent statements. And here, of course, we've got to tie this in a little bit to those delta epsilon definitions that we've been using for limits. If this is confusing, don't let it uh, get you down too much. This is pretty uh, tricky stuff. Uh, to define the definite integral, consider the following limit. The limit as the norm approaches zero of our summation from i equals one to n of our function f of c sub i times delta x sub i is equal to our limit. To say that this limit exists mean that there exists a real number l such that for every epsilon, positive epsilon, there exists a positive delta. Remember our delta epsilon sort of neighborhoods I've been calling them so that for every partition with the norm that is in the delta neighborhood, it follows that, you know, we have our absolute value, and this is just the difference between the limit and the summation. You know, the distance between those, the amount of error between the limit and our summation is somewhere within the epsilon neighborhood, regardless of the choice of c sub i in the ith subinterval for the partition delta. And here in the blue box, our uh, definition of a definite integral. Uh, if the function f is defined on the closed interval from a to b, and the limit of the Riemann sums over the partition delta, uh, the limit as the norm approaches zero, the sum from i equals one to n of our function times delta x exists as described above, then f is said to be integrable over that interval from a to b. And the limit is denoted by you know, here again we have our limit that we see above. As our norm approaches zero, our summation from i equals one to n of our function times 
delta x sub i is the same thing as we have our integral symbol and then our lower and upper limits from a to b you know our interval is from a to b and that's where we put our limits on this integral sign from a to b of f of x our function replaces this and instead of delta x we're using dx the limit is called the definite integral of f from a to b the number a is the lower limit of integration and b is the upper limit of integration and it's not a coincidence that the notation for definite integrals is similar to that for indefinite integrals. You'll see why in the next section with the fundamental theorem of calculus is introduced. For now it's important to see that definite integrals and di indefinite integrals are different concepts. The definite integral is a number, a limit, whereas an indefinite integral is a family of functions. Though Riemann sums were defined for functions with very few restrictions, a sufficient condition for a function f to be integrable on the uh, interval from a to b is that it is continuous on that interval. A proof of this theorem, sadly, is beyond the scope of our textbook. So, theorem 4.4. Continuity implies integrability. If a function f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b, then the function f is integrable on that interval from a to b. That is, the integral from a to b of f of x times dx exists. So, if you've been a little confused by all that, you know, mumbo jumbo before, you know, let's go through these examples. It'll get a little clearer, and maybe on your own time, go back and reread some of that stuff, and I'm sure it'll make a little more sense. But let's check out example two here. Uh, it says, evaluating a definite integral as a limit. Evaluate the definite integral, the integral from negative 2 to 1, of 2x times dx. And your first question should be, is this function continuous? Because if it's not continuous, we can't integrate it. Well, 2x, that's just a line. You know, y equals mx plus b. That is like 2x plus 0. That's just a line of slope 2 that goes through the origin. So yes, it's definitely continuous. I mean, let's start thinking here. We need our delta x. Uh, delta x is equal to b minus a over n, just like we were doing with the summation notation. And on this example, it is negative 2 minus 1 over n. Oh, excuse me. 1 minus negative 2 over n. You know, our lower limit is a, our upper limit is b. So b minus a would be 1 minus negative 2 over n. And minus a negative, we add the opposite. So we have our delta x is 3 over n. Delta x, 3 divided by n. Our end point, our first end point. Remember in the last section we had a little formula. It said that you could generally use a plus i times delta x. And in this example, our a value is negative 2. And then i times delta x. Well, i times this would just be 3i over n. So plus 3i divided by n. There is our end point. Let me underline that in red. All right. So let's dive into that integral. We have our integral from negative 2 to 1 of 2x dx is the exact same thing as the limit as the norm approaches 0. Or, remember, this, this is interchangeable. We could say as n goes to infinity. And, you know, for the rest of this problem, I'll stick with the, the n approaches infinity. But just remember, the norm approaching 0 and n approaching of infinity means the same thing for this problem. So now we have our summation from i equals 1 to n of the function f of c sub i times delta x. And, you know, this is just where we're going to plug in our function with our found uh, endpoint here, and delta x we found at the opening of this problem. So let me just replace that right now. Remember now, our function is 2x dx. So we're going to have 2 
times this underlined in red value minus 2 plus 3i over n. So that right there was our function 2 times x or 2 times this endpoint. And then we're going to multiply that by the width 3 over n, our delta x. So again, this here is the height of each rectangle. We plug our, our x value into the function. And this here is the width of each rectangle. Length times width is the area. And we're going to sum that up. So let's see what we can do here to make this a little simpler to deal with. We'll have our limit as n goes to infinity. And let's drag some stuff, anything we can, out in front of the summation symbol. Well, here we can pull this term out. That's 3 over n. And we have this just lonely constant sitting here, too. Let's pull both of those out. 2 times 3 is 6, and that's going to be over n. So we're going to have 6 over n pulled out in front of our summation symbol from i equals 1 to n. Now, let's replace, oop, we still have our negative 2 there, plus we have 3 over n times i, 3 over n, and let's replace that i with our formula, n times n plus 1 over 2, n times n plus 1 all over 2. And let's see, I guess, since we replaced our i with our formula, that n times n plus 1 over 2, you know, that's when we drop our summation symbol. So we can just, instead of rewriting all of that just to get rid of that summation, let me just do this, get that out of there. And then I guess we could squeeze this over a little bit more. All right. Let's see what we can do to simplify some stuff in here now. It looks like this n is going to cancel out with this n. And let's see, we still haven't applied our n to infinity yet. So we're going to have 6 over n times, we still have our negative 2 there. Plus, let's see, if we distribute the 3 across the top, we're going to have 3 times n. And 3 times 1 is 3, so we're going to have 3n plus 3. And let's break those into separate fractions. They just have the denominator of 2. So we can get rid of this. Okay, we're almost ready to let n go to infinity. We just got to distribute that 6 over n. So, 6 over n times negative 2 is going to be negative 12 over n. Ooh, ooh, hold the phone here. I forgot something when we applied that summation. I guess I could just do it from right here. When I got rid of the summation symbol, I forgot to apply that summation to this constant. We would have had the summation from i equals 1 to n of just plain old negative 2. And when we do that, remember, we just take our upper limit times that lower limit. So this would be a negative 2n. Aha. A little mistake, but it definitely changes the dynamic of the whole problem. So that is a minus 2n at the beginning. I apologize. So an easy fix, though. So let's distribute that 6 over n now. The limit as n goes to infinity. Uh, 6 times negative 2n is negative 12n over n. And then we distribute to the second term. We will have plus 18n over 2n. And then distribute to the last term. Plus 18 over 2n. So now we can let our n go to infinity. Here the n's cancel. So there is nothing to let to go to infinity there. We just have a negative 12. Plus. Here also the n's cancel. 18 divided by 2 is 9, no n's to head off to infinity. Plus, 18 divided by 2 times infinity will head off to 0. 
So we have negative 12 plus 9, and that's just negative 3. There is our Riemann sum. And this is not the area under a curve. When we were doing area under a curve, we had everything was above the x-axis. Everything was positive and continuous because we were finding area. If we stick to uh, that idea, you know, here we would have positive area above the x-axis. And this is sort of negative area under the axis. And, you know, we really can't have negative area. So this Riemann sum has a value of negative 3.